Well, yeah. Yeah, um, it is uh, Friday, uh, October 20, 2023, and I am calling the regular meeting of the Finance Committee to order um, at this time, and uh, thank everyone for being here. I think that um, as I look at the screen, and I'm going to call attendance in just a moment, that uh, Alicia has not joined us in Kathy is not going to be able to join us today, as it turns out, uh, but we're otherwise ready to proceed. Uh, this uh, meeting is being held by Zoom, and members of the public have access to the meeting and by Zoom, And uh, but everybody who is watching should be advised that this meeting is being recorded, both uh, for visual and audio purposes. So you should be aware that the meeting will be recorded and, of course, available to the public um, later also through the town uh, website and YouTube channel. Um, so having said that, what I'd like to do is uh, just make sure that everybody who's on the committee can hear me and be heard. So I'll just go through the list. Um, Anna? Yep, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Lynn? Present. Bob? I'm here. Matt? Present. Bernie? Present. Kathy is not uh, able to join us, and uh, we don't have any indication as of yet that uh, Alicia is with. It. I've reached out to her. And uh, I noticed that there are two members of the public present. The plan for this meeting, just so we can get the um, be clear to everybody, is the agenda is going to uh, be in the order that it is presented as posted, which means we're going to start with public comment, then we're going to go to the reparations discussion, and um, after that, uh, there's a very brief presentation that um, Athena is going to make to us about uh, the surplus property, real property. It's not going to be a, a, a real discussion today, but she's just going to give us a background um, information about it. Um, and then I think that she'll, uh, Dave Zomack is going to present and be available for a later meeting in which there'll be more discussion about it. Uh, and then the remainder of the time we will, um, that's available up until three o'clock, which is kind of a hard stop for several people who are on the committee uh, to start a discussion of the rental registration uh, fee schedule. Uh, there was a report from last night's um, CRC meeting, which we only received this morning. So, the committee has not had a lot of time with it. So um, to the committee, any questions about the agenda or the order? So if there are none, um, then I guess, uh, why don't we um, see if there's any requests for public comment, any member of the public who is entitled to make a presentation to the committee? for um, up to three minutes about any issue that um, is uh, related to a matter that is or might come before the Finance Committee. Um, there's no limitation that it has to be related to the agenda at all. And um, I see one hand that has gone up. So um, uh, if there's a second person um, requesting, um, let me know, but Renata is now available. And uh, so I uh, will ask uh, Renata, welcome to the meeting, and uh, Renata Shepard, and um, please identify yourself and um, indicate at least what, um, that you're an Amherst resident and what section of town you live in. You don't have to go farther than that. And then uh, please offer your comment. Hi, good afternoon, Renata Schapper from Justice Drive in Amherst. Um, 
Last night, CRC outdid themselves. All these months of discussion about making permit fees fair went out the window. I am disheartened with their decision to propose keeping the permit fee base at $250 and capping larger properties at $700 in order to simplify fees for applicants. We are not so stupid not to understand that three or four different fees relate to property size. $700 is nothing for large properties, but 250 plus inspections is a hardship for me and many other small landlords. CRC did not consider my per bedroom proposal, so I am offering you another idea. 50 for owner-occupied parcels, 75 for condos, 100 for single-family homes as base fees. Add 50 or 75 for additional unit per parcel. Increase the cap for larger properties. Other towns cap at $2,500 or more. And only charge 15 or 25 or 50 per yearly permit, depending on the town. And that in includes Boston, which is a big city. Um, I am urging you not to accept a $250 fee across the board. At this, this is extremely unfair to smaller landlords. And I also urge you to have a full board, a full committee, uh, before making a final vote for this proposed fee. Um, I should probably share some of some math with you in hopes that you can understand my point. My two-bedroom condo is rented to a wonderful family for 10 years. Current rent is $1,540 for a two-bedroom. It may or may not increase to $1,600 or $1,700 next June. We'll have to see. Uh, mortgage and insurance is about $800. Condo fee $400 started in January. Property tax is $300 a month. It will go up because it's Amherst. Repair, maintenance, cushion, about $60. Uh, not enough, but I can't do more. So that's a $20 loss per month. And wait, I forgot all the fees you want me to pay. I could raise my rent to market value, 200 and, I mean, 2200 or 1300 displace my beloved tenants, rent it to three or four rowdy students who will destroy my property and cause me to become a nuisance property and incur for more fees. So those are the, you know, options. You are shooting affordable housing in the foot. What is next? Rent control? Thank you very much. Hey, uh, Renata, before you leave, um, you had submitted a uh, uh, comment to the council, and uh, but I don't know if your recommend, recommendation that you made at the beginning of this presentation about the amount of the fees was included. You did share some of the other information that was in that I remember from the uh which you would send to the council if you could at least send it to me as the chair of the committee or however you choose to do it but at least to me uh what your recommendation was um i can um it would be very helpful um for the record to have that recommendation available if you're comfortable with it uh, for your direct email with that Yes, you can just send it to my direct email, uh, my my council address, Steinberg A at emerstma.gov, and I uh, will um, share it with the rest of the committee um, before we, um, to, we do not anticipate that we're going to be making any recommendations today, so it's, uh, there's time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I don't see anyone else in the audience who's asked to make public comment. So with that, um, I'm going to turn to the next agenda item, which is the AHRA uh, Amherst African Heritage Reparation Assembly recommendation that was presented to the council on Monday night and there was discussion some discussion on Monday. I wanted to um, start um, today's discussion by um, since the uh, resident members of the committee were not present and uh, the council members had a few more days to think about it to see if there are questions about the report itself. Um, and I'm not specifically at this point, um, excluding it down to what was referred to the committee, the rest of the discussion, we will wanna focus only on 
part three, what was referred to the committee, but uh, the entire uh, report has context. So um, if there are any uh, questions or Michelle, if you have anything that you would like to say in introduction, um, I look for hands um, and uh, give you a moment to raise hands and see. You, Michelle. Just I'm really just here to. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay, so I'm just here to answer any questions that you might have about the recommendations. Um, when it comes time for you all to discuss them as a committee, I will be uh, leaving the meeting, but I'm always available. So please feel free to reach out if you have you know, additional questions that come up as you have your discussion. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any general questions that uh, anyone has um, before we get into, uh, Lynn? This may be exactly what we're going to discuss, but I would like to make sure that we review the various um, proposed ways of funding the project from the um, report? And also, are we going to go ahead and discuss other possible ways of funding? Uh, I think that is our subject because what we are uh, charged by the council to review is section three. And um, so I think anything that you just described would be included in the section three discussion, which is where we're going to narrow to after we uh, make sure there are no additional questions that are unrelated to question th to section three. Um, Anna? Yeah, my, uh, this is more a question for Michelle. I'm curious if there was a process to, it's it's such a long report that I don't want to say I want like a legal opinion on the full thing, but I'm curious if there was a process to get a legal review done on the recommendations in the report just to figure out, you know, I think some of them require enabling legislation, some of them to kind of figure out what the level of current or, or like level of legality under current law is and then where it would need special legislation versus where it's not necessarily doable under either. Um, and I don't know that that last category is true at all, but I, I'm curious if there, if a lawyer had looked at this at all. And because I think that as we go through recommendations, I'm trying to figure out which is the cart and which is the horse, right? So do we want to figure out which ones we want to kind of prioritize first as a committee and then seek a legal opinion on those? Or does that not matter to the committee? And that's fine too. That was a super clean question, I know. But basically, I'm just asking if this has been reviewed by legal counsel in any way. Thanks, Anna. Um, so in the appendix of the report, you'll see the extent of legal advice that I have received as the chair of the HRA. So okay. I'm not sure if town manager Bachelman has um, consulted with the town attorney, but just to kind of back up and say, as we were developing these options, we were in communication with Sean at the time, with the town manager, um, to sort of uh, try to understand, you know, what the limitations might be based on the original legal opinions that we received. And in the end, I decided that instead of going and asking Paul again to do another legal opinion based on these options that we first allow the council to decide which options they'd like to pursue and yeah. then um you know ask for legal counsel based on that so that's that's kind of the general does that answer the question it really does i think that's what i was trying to figure out is like do we do the legal opinion first or do we do the council decide you know like that kind of thing so thank you and i so just to clarify your point you're saying that uh at least the first kind of run through of this was vetted by town staff and then but not necessarily that the final draft is that what you're saying yeah so the um the three options were developed in consultation with sean and the town manager um we had a meeting that 
uh, where we reviewed the options that we were thinking about. And in fact, um, the town manager uh, is uh, responsible for option B, um, which I thought was very creative. Uh, so we sort of just threw some ideas around. I mean, I, I, I guess I should say that what's most important for from our perspective, what was most important was to one, be able to start pursuing initiatives sooner than 10 years and now as possible, um, and to have some meaningful amount of funding to do that on an annual basis. So those are kind of the two goals that we have. Mm -hmm. And we're very, very, we were very sort of open to how we would meet those goals. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bernie? Bernie, you're muted. All right, now, <laughs> now I can be clear. Um, I, I just want to be clear on who the target population is for the reparations. I know the report has three general categories. Um, folks who have uh, who've descended from persons who were enslaved in Amherst, folks who are descended from persons who were enslaved elsewhere, and then just about everybody else, um, if I've got that right. And what I'd like to get clear on is, is how tied does a person have to be to Amherst before they can be considered for reparations? We have a substantial right. transient population of you know, folks who are here for one to four years and they move on. And while they're here, are they considered eligible or you know, what, what it, this is a tough, I know this is a tough question, but I just want to get clear on, on who the targets are here. Yeah, no, it's a great question and it's really important. Um, you know, the el eligibility piece is something that we were charged with um, discussing and reporting on. Um, but the expectation, I think, is we provided some guidance. And we hope that a successor committee will be um, formed and that that guidance will be used as a reference. Um, but, you know, depending on whether we're talking about programmatic initiatives um, versus uh, like a direct benefit, for example, um, like a, a down payment for a home or a, um, a, even a cash payment that would require special legislation, I think the eligibility criteria is going to vary. Um, so I think when it comes to the more programmatic uh, initiatives, they'll be more um, inclusive uh, than maybe some of the other initiatives, let's say, that would involve housing and that may look to uh, historical harms. Um, that have occurred in the community mm -hmm. as a way of defining the eligibility for, for that kind of benefit. Um, I, I, you know, it's, I think it's going to, it's going to really kind of happen when the, when the, hopefully the successor body um, begins actually looking at implementing the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Well, I just, you know, just as a, as a historian, as someone who, um, is is interested in ancestry, my own and others, um, and how that works. It's it's a given that it's going to be very difficult for someone to trace their heritage back to um, someone who is enslaved because of the vagarities of record keeping and the non person status that enslaved individuals had. So um, you, you know, so that's why the eligibility question becomes critical too to make sure that you you know you you're, you're not defining this down to a point where it's impossible for someone to demonstrate eligibility. Absolutely, Bernie. And we discussed that uh, a, a bit on Monday night during the presentation, um, the, the difficulty uh, in, in, you know, providing the documentation that would be required under a more limited eligibility, you know, um, framework. So that's, all going to be uh, needing discussion as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other general questions? Yeah, Lynn. 
You're muted now. Thank you. I just want to clarify that in looking at the three options for the financial way of dealing with the fund, the goal is to have some money that you can do that the town can do at the recommendation of a committee that the town can do things with sooner rather than later so that there would be a way to do this without waiting till we fund the full fund and live off of the interest. Yes, exactly. And okay. so I think that's why, you know, option B is it, it, I, I, I'm not going to advocate for any one option, but I think option B was really creative because it helps us to, you know, it, it continues growing the fund, but it also helps us to begin pursuing these initiatives now. Um, and so, uh, you know, and that $100,000 that we identified was based on, uh, you know, looking at other initiatives, other sort of um, projects and ways that we could uh, partner with other, uh, you know, aligned initiatives that are already happening in the community. Um, we felt that that number would be meaningful enough to to make some real you know reparative change oh so can i just pursue further andy sure because several of the concepts that you know you've talked about in the report in terms of how what you would like to pursue let me let me stick to one that i don't think uh gets into whether or not CPA or CDBG money. But, um, you know, there is a strong um, group of people in Amherst who would like to see a youth center. Okay. And you mention in your report, a youth center. So this is the uh, third committee that we've seen a youth center recommended from. And the town manager at least in one version of the A8 of the ARPA money, which is the COVID money from the federal government, um, had put aside a half million or five hundred thousand dollars for uh, beginning to set up a youth center. I, I want to make sure that I'm saying that. So your uh, concept would be that AHRA might also come to the table with some money for a youth center? Is that what I'm hearing in terms of wanting to do something more immediate um, than rather than wait till the fund is fully funded? And let me just say, in that case, um, I don't think there's any legal barrier to that, but it would end up being a combination of money that might come from ARPA money and might come from um, the AHRA fund in some way. Is that is that an example? Yes, I think uh, you know through our consultation process, um, youth programming certainly rose to the top. Um, I I don't think we thought about using the funding that would be available to us um, for like the creation of a facility, for example. Um, I think we thought more about program programmatic or other costs that would um, be incurred as the youth center uh, was developed. Um, right. So I do think that that is absolutely um, a, a great example. And I also just want to be sure that uh, you know, the consultation with that successor body continues so that it, we don't become sort of split like, oh, this was recommended and so let's take that $100,000 out of there and put it here, uh, just ensuring that we continue to have that consultation or that collaboration with the, the successor body. Um, but that certainly did rise to the top for our uh, funding priorities. Okay, uh, but I could go on and, and push on this, um, but let's leave it there for now. Thank you. Matt? 
Thanks, Andy. Um, thanks, Michelle, and all for for the good conversation. So I apologize if this is duplicative. I just want to make sure I understand the the essence of the question. We are we have a um, we have a town council action last year to add um, essentially all the cannabis money uh, up to a certain cap every year until we hit, we hit two million. With the eventual plan being that, that two million would then generate um, interest and other revenue, and the revenue from that two million would be used for for paying for programs. And the question before us now is, um, how can this be structured so that the successor body has money to spend sooner than than the two million to spend before we get to that two million point? Is that right? How how can that be established? Yeah, and it, it it even seems, you know, when I think back to the original commitment that we made, um, you know, given that we now have this uh, information that we do and the recommendations that we've made, um, the idea is that we accelerate the timeline so that we can begin, uh, you know, pursuing initiatives now and not waiting until we get to that full test. Two million, um, which is where you know option one comes from. Well, let's get there now, you know, <laughs> uh, by taking moving money from one bucket to another bucket. And again, um, it would remain as an endowment, so the principal stays intact, and uh, just uh, using the investment to come off of that. So does that get at your yeah that that helps. And so so then my I guess my question is. Um, without changing the funding scheme, it would take longer to get to the 2 million, but without changing the funding scheme is, is AHARA slash, you know, kind of, or are you, or, or um, is there an openness to sort of giving discretion over using the funds that are in the account now and the annual amount of funds that go in, you know, discretionary. So it would take longer to get to the 2 million but you would have money to spend on an annual basis. Is that is that idea on the table? Is that something folks are considering? Is the question um, are, so yes, like with option B, it would grow uh, the fund more slowly, but it would give us access immediately to funding. Um, so that was sort of like a middle ground say, okay, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with cannabis tax revenue. So if we're continuing to model off of that, I think we do have to consider, uh, well, what is the, what is the least amount that we want to, if option B were pursued, um, that we want to allocate to reparations on an annual basis. If the cannabis tax revenue goes down to $50,000, if we're still modeling off of that, then, you know, uh, we're going to be not only growing the funds very slowly, we're going to have uh, little access to funds to pursue the initiative. So I do think that should be part of the discussion that the finance committee considers in terms of the source of the funding. Right. I have more questions, but I see a bunch of hands going up. So I'm going to, I'll sit back for a sec. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just I just wanted to know, and, and may, Paul, maybe you can answer this. How much money do we have currently in the, the reparations fund? And what are we projecting to be the cannabis revenues over the next year or two? I can't answer that question. I can find out for you, certainly. Okay. Well, so I just I, I think it's important that we understand mm -hmm. what the base, you know, what our baseline is. Um, yeah, before we, we start talking about options. Yeah, Michelle is right that the cannabis revenues is dropping. So, um, so, but I can get that information for you. Great, thank you. And Bob, I can mm -hmm. just add that I think when I checked with Sean just before he left, um, the fund has maybe like 410 or 413, something like that in it from the past two allocations that have occurred. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I guess that there was one other um, piece to this I was going to add when we get to questions later. And so we'll kind 
come back to it so it gets on the list, but um, the uh, Cannabis Control Commission has had discussions at various times about um, licensing what they sometimes call cafes where people can uh, buy and use marijuana in a social setting similar to going into a bar and drinking alcohol. And uh, at one point, Amherst was listed as one of the communities, one of the municipalities that might be a pilot in such a program. I don't know if that's still operative or not. But if it, um, that happened, would there be additional cannabis fees and what's the likelihood of it happening? And I don't know if there's any, if you, Paul, if you have any uh, assessment of those questions. But you don't have to answer that today either. Yeah, no, um, we are open to that. We don't have regulations that would allow it. We, we have to do some re regulatory work internally with our own bylaws. Um, We've been identified as one of those communities, as you mentioned, uh, Andy. And if we did open some one or more in town, that would generate more revenue for the cannabis tax because it'd be more sales. Yeah. Uh, going back to the group, Lynn. I think Bernie's before me. Bernie, do you have some? Go ahead. You have to unmute again. Yep. Yeah, I just no, I just took my microphone off. Uh, back on. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a remark on the cannabis cafes. I think we need to think very hard before we put more uh, folks who may be somewhat inebriated on the streets in Amherst. Uh, it might not be the best thing. Um, Michelle, I just want to go back to because I, I I think I've heard you say, and I want to understand this that, that it's important that we have a successor committee in place before um, a lot of decisions and details uh, uh, get discussed. Is that correct? Michelle? So that you for the question? Or? Well, you know, my concern is, is that we, you know, um, we don't get ahead of ourselves on this. If, if, if the reparations committee believes that there needs to be a committee in play, a decision-making body in place that can help direct the implementation, that we want to be careful that we leave things open for them. And I, you know, I congratulate the committee on being largely descriptive and not prescriptive in, 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 their, rec in their recommendations that I think makes it, you know, makes the whole thing more workable. Um, but I, I would like to be able to, before we have a discussion of, say, a youth center, I'd like to see that there's a committee in place to say, yes, it is a priority, and the youth center gets balanced against, say, um, using monies from the fund for soft seconds so people can buy housing. Uh, you, you know, those are those are decisions that are going to have to be made because we're going to deal, no matter what we do, we're dealing with a limited pool of funds. Um, so, <clears throat> and the other thing I would like to see going forward with this is, uh, that uh, before we do something, get subject to a make or buy assessment, because I think uh, for a number of these initiatives, it might be better, as council pointed out as well, um, uh, uh, a, uh, a minority business enterprise that's a not organized as a not, not for profit corporation could have greater degrees of freedom in implementing this stuff than the, the town might have. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate those comments. And I think. Um, it, you know, recognizing the importance of that successor body, being able to, as you said, balance the um, various priorities um, against what is already out there for the town as a priority and, and what the community needs is, is really important. I don't think that um, necessarily uh, means that the town council or the finance committee, I think we're at, we're the timing of looking at um, you know, acceleration or finding some way to begin uh, this process now is is good timing because, um, you know, without any access to funding, then the successor body really isn't necessary um, to some extent. Um, so I think that it's good timing all around. Okay. You need to pause for a moment for a couple of reasons. 
One is Alicia joined us about five minutes ago, and it should show that, uh, but I want to make sure that Alicia can hear us and we can hear her. Hi, yes, I can. Thank you, Andy. Okay. And just so you know, what we're doing is we um, divided the AHRA discussion into two parts. This is the, uh, I'm going to try and cut it off in a couple minutes, is general questions about the report that don't have to specifically relate to um, Section 3, which was what it was referred to the Finance Committee. But I am cutting it off in a minute or two um, because we want to turn to what was assigned. And the goal for today is to identify questions, some of which have already been brought up, that um, need to be considered as we um, analyze question three, things, the information that we need for the next uh, meeting and a list of issues to help us uh, define the discussion for the next meeting where we're really going to be focusing on the charge that was given to our committee. Um, so, Alicia, if you have any general questions or comments about the report, this is a time because we're going to narrow it in a moment. Uh, Lynn? Yeah, one of the questions I'd like to ask is if the fund was fully funded at about at at two million, what would be the percentage of interest rate we would expect to be able to draw on annually? And I think the place where we might look to a comparable would be the library um, fund in terms of how much they draw off of it annually for operations. Um, and then a, a, a additional question um, that goes along with that is um, if we use these funds, um, can we use these funds for program operation and capital? Is there any restriction on what the funds can be used for based on how we initially set up the fund. Do you want me to be adding these? This yeah, is where you want to start hold adding questions. questions. And, uh, hold, make sure you have those recorded. Uh, um, see if Michelle has anything further. Mm -hmm. Michelle, your hand has been up to the entire time, which- Oh, I apologize. Know, uh, <laughs> I can never- When you want no. to be recognized. Uh, uh, no, I'm going to, I'm going to lower it. And I don't, I think that Lynn's questions are great. And I don't think, I think they're probably for Paul and, you know, others to explore uh, further, um, but I'm going to lower my, my hand. And I would love to know if Alicia, before I leave the meeting, just to make sure that um, Alicia or any other committee member that hasn't asked, you know, that might have a question um, has, has the chance to do that. Alicia. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, I haven't really thought like I'm not I haven't been as thoughtful as I would like to be in how to formulate this exact question, but I'm wondering about how you envision the funds will be used and like the replenishing of funds. So like once we have hit what we deemed for it to be like a a like fully operating reparations fund and we're utilizing the funds is there like a reimbursement vision or do we have to be over the certain mark before we start distributing funds or I'm just using how I'm wondering how we expect to be using the fund yeah that's a good question I think it will depend and largely on which of these options or some other option uh, that the town council ultimately uh, goes with. So I think, um, you know, in terms of replenishment, if we do keep it set up as an endowment, then the principle will always remain. So whether you move to, you know, the, the balance to get, get us to 2 million now, or whether we grow it more slowly, that money will stay in the fund and we'll be using the investment um, income off of that on an annual basis, which gives us um, a, a really uh, powerful sort of sustaining um, 
you know, it's, it's, it can sustain us long into the future. Um, and I expect that this, as the, um, as, as the community comes forward more to voice what is needed and as some of these initiatives are beginning to, uh, you know, um, manifest that the, uh, how the money is used will, it, it, this is definitely a live, um, not, it's not static at all. It's definitely a living <laughs> uh, body of recommendations. Does okay. that answer the question, Alicia? Yes, that is helpful. Um, I think I, it just is also helpful me, for me in terms of thinking of what the options are to understand like how it will be used. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the expectation is that that successor body will, will get up and running and take what we have provided provided in our report and begin to sort of um, focus in a little bit more than we have. So we tried to provide, based on what we heard from the community, some funding priorities and areas that we um, understood in that process to be important for the community. But I think the successor body really is going to have the opportunity to hear more from the community and, and understand um, sort of what is needed in order to fulfill the reparative goals that we have. So I think that what I would like to do now, uh, just managing time and knowing we have a three o'clock card stop time, is that um, Lynn has a document and what it is, is questions that I received from um, other counselors were the were one through six um, on the document, and uh, so uh, because, as you recall, at the um, end of the council meeting, Lynn requested that if there were questions of the finance committee, they be forwarded to me and to Athena, and um, so that was what one through six are is uh, things that were received by that route. And then uh, Lynn has added three others based, I believe, on the discussion that we've just had. Uh, what we're going to try and do is um, continue on. And the purpose of this is to make sure that we end this meeting with an organized list of additional information that we uh, wish to obtain in order to um, do the work that's been assigned to us or other or issues that uh, are recommended for discussion at the uh, by the committee as we work through our assignment. So um, what we're trying to do now is to look at that list. Um, I'm not suggesting in any means removing questions that were posed from the council in the one through six. Um, I'm looking to add to them because uh, that was, I think, the understanding uh, with the council. So does that make sense? Anybody object to what I just said? Andy, my, my hand is up. It's not, an, it's not an objection. It's a question. Yeah. Um, okay. Go ahead. Is your next in order. And Michelle, I don't know. Your hand is still up. Are you looking to be recognized? Okay, thanks. Um, go ahead. So I think my my question is uh, looking for modeling. So can we model can we model out the the impact if we give the successor body some discretionary percentage of funds or 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 amount of funds to use on an annual basis? So you know it slows down that <clears throat> accumulation up to two million. But it also allows them to start, um, you know, investing in programs sooner than than ten years out. Okay. I um, I want to say I will mention one other thing that um, Kathy Shane was 
planning to be here for the first part of our meeting today, but um, she was down uh, in New York for um, family reasons, and she determined this morning that she was not going to be able to join us. She has a list of questions that she was going to add to, uh, it would sort of be in the council questions as well as member section, but uh, uh, she may have additional questions that were not there. And I thought of it as you were speaking because I think that one of her questions is pretty much exactly what you just put in, Matt. Bob, on to you. Yeah, I um I had a uh, it, it's it's more of a question of it's kind of a follow up to what Bernie uh, raised uh, the issue um how this fund is administered I mean especially if the, one of the suggestions in part three is to establish in a charity uh, based on you know for contributions from from the public and how would that be administered relative to the stabilization or the, the 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 fund which presumably has to come through the town council for authorization to spend is that correct i mean would we be set, setting up a separate pot of money that i mean who would who would be the decision makers on how to spend that charity money um I think I'm going to leave that, uh, get that onto the list of questions, but also reflect on the fact that when we set this up originally, I think that what Sean had proposed was that having everything remain in the enterprise fund, uh, um, that the um, and then uh, come out of the our stabilization fund rather and then come out of the stabilization fund would require council approval for each time that there's an expenditure so that it remained within council control uh, to make a final decision. Uh, so that was what how I understood his recommendation. Yeah, that's that's what that was my understanding as well. The reason I asked this question is if if we had a a charity again, I don't think we have to answer it now. But if we had a charity, how would that be administered? How would those funds be administered? Could I so, jump in real quick just to answer, just to give um, a little bit of background about what I learned regarding that, Andy? Yeah. Um... I think that at this point, what we're trying to do is not answer questions, but to pose questions. Okay. Well, I can send a note just because I do have some, um, Pamela Young did some pretty great research on how um, the, the friends of model might work. Um, so I can send that along to you, Andy, and you can share it with the committee. And that might be helpful for Bob's question here. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, the list that we're developing obviously is a public document it's being developed on the screen that you can't see because you're attached by phone, but it will be available. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'll, it'll give you a chance to um, think about the questions um, that are being posed and the issues that are being posed in advance of the next meeting. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. Bob? I don't have anything else. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Bernie? Thanks, Andy. Um, the fund that we're talking about, the $2 million, that is a discrete fund uh, over and above or in addition to um, is that a discrete fund over and above uh, any additional um, resources we can bring to bear, like CDBG money, like uh, 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 community preservation money, or does any contribution from the CPA or the CB CDBG pool or any other pool, does that count towards the $2 million?
Okay. Seeing no other hands from committee members up at the moment. Um, I had thought about a couple of things. One is in relation to option one, since at this point, no options are off the table because we were not voting today on anything was the understand it was our understanding. Uh, what would be an estimate of the amount of time that it would take to repay the fund if we did uh, did what was suggested in option one and what effect that would have on other stabilization funds? Andy, is, I believe that question is pretty much up here. Um, you may be right. Yeah. Okay. And um, Matt has his, his hand up, as does Michelle. Yeah, Andy. Oh, can I go ahead, Andy? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I... I um. Since you raised that, I, I do have a question about. Um, I guess it's option three, which which I don't I don't support. I don't think, but I but you know that's I don't I don't need to say that right now. We're just talking about all the options that are on the table. Um, but I would be interested in any consequences to implementing option three in terms of uh, bond rating, availability of that capital that we were talking about moving. Um, so just sort of, you know, again, sort of an analysis of, you know, what would be the implications on the other accounts if we were to pursue option three? Um. Michelle has her hand up, Andy. Michelle, did you? Are I you... don't. I, you know what? I'm. I. <laughs> if you guys don't mind, I think this has been a great discussion. It sounds like you're going to start to move on. I'm going to jump off. My, <laughs> my, my hand function here on the phone is just wild. Um, but thank you so much, and I'll look forward to continuing to follow these questions and get you whatever information I can to support answering them. Okay. Yeah, well, thank okay. you. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll I'll see you guys next time. Have a good okay. weekend. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Um, I think the thank other question... just specific specificity on that number 14 that you just put in there, Lynn. Just I mean, I, I was obviously there's a I feel like if that question is read as is, the answer is they they become less, which I that's not quite the nuance I was trying to um tease out there. I, uh, you know, so so for example, bond rating, for example, um, you know, the overall fiscal health of the town. I, I just I don't want an answer that says the money will be less because I, I was looking for a little bit more nuance than that. And and I guess that the last question I have was related to that in some ways, um, because uh, the way I was phrasing it was, uh, are there any legal risks risks to our bond rating or um, comments from our um, accounting firm that uh, we need to be aware of as we continue this discussion. I'm going to combine the two, bond rating. Is it's the accounting firm or the um uh,
You well, mean I was thinking that should we be asking is their name is now Markham, it used to be uh Melanson. Uh should we be asking whether they have any advice for us or whether uh our town attorney has any advice for us about any risks that we are um, should be aware of. Okay. So, I have I have other questions, but to be honest, I think they're more based on the referral that was made to GOL. And that will be taken up by GOL. Yeah, I had I had left my I had a question that I submitted to GOL. Okay. Also as uh Lynn probably knows and I was not bringing that up today because it's related to the committee charge and not to the financial piece that we were referred to this committee. All right. So um, I think that under the circumstances, the only thing that uh, I would certainly want to do is make sure that if Kathy had questions that she had intended to bring up today, uh, that we uh, keep the list open for that purpose. And therefore, if anybody else from the committee submits questions, uh, to me and to Athena, we can add them to the list too, it to be totally fair. But Matt? I'm just channeling Kathy from previous meetings. I, I mean, I, I just, I know that she has a lot of questions about the mechanism for council approval before funds get distributed. Uh, I think that's probably not a question. I mean, that question is known. But it might be worth just explicitly adding it to the list for the sake of, um, you know, I think everybody on finance would like to would like to know the answer to that question and, and sort of be um, be comfortable with that. The so Paul, give your hand up. Awesome. Yeah, so yeah. if I can throw in um, uh, just, a, I'm not sure if it's appropriate for me to put these, these are council questions, but I'd be remiss if staff weren't asking questions about or the creation of another committee that needed support. Um, is there an existing committee that could take on the responsibilities of this uh, of this this uh, function? And you know, what would the staffing needs of a new committee require? What kind of what kind of support would they need? And um, so I think I, we've got a lot of people managing lots of different committees. And when they see another committee getting created, they start to squirm a little bit. <laughs> Certainly I want to leave that on because that gets into financial consequence of the cost in staff time yep. of supporting another committee. So I think that may be a CRC question or a GOL question too. Okay, is there anything else? Or can we close this off and turn to the next agenda item? Um, and Andy, do you want me to send this to you and Athena or to the whole committee? It can get posted. I'll send it to Athena and she can post it. Thank you. Yeah, why don't you send it to Athena and to me and then let us decide what to do. Um, because we also want to make sure uh, that we get Kathy's questions and uh, then we can edit them in if they're to the extent that they're not already stated. I, uh, Andy, I believe Athena might have something to say. I think we actually have to post it now that it's been discussed. 
we should we should post it and if you have Kathy's questions we can add Kathy's okay I will uh leave that to you uh Athena because uh you're the one who understands what what you're tending to do on the OML requirements is there anything else that uh any members of the committee want to talk about it, right today regarding reparations otherwise we have a couple other subjects to move to actually I think we have three including next meeting planning so seeing no hands I'm going to assume that we're completed with that the next item was that um, real property disposition was on the agenda uh, not for any uh, substantial discussion today but um, uh, to sort of begin us preparing for real discussion to, uh, within the next meetings um, as you may recall that was a matter that was referred to us by the council and uh, we're trying to see if we can get back to it and uh, reach any conclusions before the end of the current term uh, and that's why um, but Athena uh, would plan to be called on at this point so that you could uh, tell us about what you've been doing. Thanks, Andy. I um, I spoke with, um, so this was referred back to Finance Committee because in one of Finance Committee's previous reports, there was a recommendation to update the policy for our new form of government. The previous policy was adopted by the Select Board, I think in March 2018. And um, the way our form of government works, it just doesn't make sense to have that policy the way it was. It was very directive of the town manager and how the town manager brought surplus property mm -hmm. to the select board and then the select board bringing it to town meeting for a vote. Uh, now that we have an executive that's the town manager and can um, form his own advisory committees and so on at his own discretion before bringing recommendations about surplus property to the council, um, it didn't make sense to include a lot of those details in a new policy. So um, I've drafted this based on the conversation with Dave and Sharin. Some of the ref some of the text that was in the old policy was it was rephrased from general laws. And so I've left in re references to general laws um, and requirements that the, the council, the town comply with general laws, but not the text itself. So that if any of those change, we don't have to go back and change the policy. I also referred to um, five, four or five different cities and towns, uh, real property disposition policy in um, coming up with the requirements um, in regard to the town manager's report to the council, um, the information to be included in the report about properties that he would make a request to the council about. Um, I think that's where uh, I'm looking for some input from the committee about what they'd like to see there. And we also have a mechanism for public comment, a public hearing and timelines there. Those are not required by law, but um, there was a, a public comment opportunity in the previous policy. And I think it makes sense to have a public notice and comment in the new policy. Um, and then a quick note at the end, the disposition of town property requires a two third vote by law, but if there is, um, acceptance of the mass general law that um, af affordable housing be allowed to be disposed of or property to be disposed of for the purpose of affordable housing that can be a majority vote vote but the the town would have to accept that general law thank you and for the rights of the committee you know referred to sharin and as uh sharin is uh sharin Everett, and she's an attorney at our uh, law firm that represents the town, it's KP Law. Uh, so this is in our packet. It's not for uh, was not intended for discussion today, but we wanted to 
give you kind of a preview and introduction. And uh, if so, if there are any general questions that you feel you can ask Athena now about what she just reported. Otherwise, uh, the detail we want to do later, Matt. Oh, well, I think it just kind of prompted me to ask a question because we I know we kind of issued this charge and discussed this probably a year and a half ago or more. Um, are we anticipating, you know, some action and in, in moving to, uh, forward on this in the next few months or, or when, you know, when should we see, when should we expect it to hear more information about this? Are you this asking about sorry. the a new spot. draft? If, if, are you asking if the town's planning on bringing a request to the council or just a new draft of the policy? Request to the council. No, I think this was, you know, the council and the finance committee had discussed at various points properties in town that were um, maybe costing the town for maintenance or weren't maintained and so that's what prompted um, the council or the finance committee to start looking at this policy and think about um, how those properties might be disposed of if the town manager determines that um, they're no longer um, for public use a good use Right, property. right. And there was like talk of a, a committee being formed to start sort of compiling that list and reviewing that list. So I was just I was just curious if there was any um, update or action heading towards that. And it's fine if that's still in the future. I just, just no. Out. There was in the previous policy there was an advisory committee um, that would advise the town manager because our form of government has changed. The town manager can form of an advisory committee if he chooses, but it wouldn't need to be a public body. Um, and it would be up to the town manager to determine who and how many people he wants to um, receive input from before he would make a request from the town council, a request to the town council to do anything with property. So um, what this new draft is focused on is what the council wants to see in the policy before it makes any act before it takes any action on a request from the town manager rather than mandating how the town manager does his job because, the select board previously was the executive and they were more directive to the town manager. Um, now that the town manager's the executive, he's, he has a little bit more discretion, a lot more discretion to, to figure out how, who he wants to consult and so forth before bringing a request to the council. Okay. Andy, I can't raise my hand, but I have yeah, a question. Go ahead. Uh, so Athena, this is, the proposed substitute for the existing policy. Correct. And at some point, perhaps, which would be nice, um, before we finish the term of this council, is would the finance committee be able to finish their discussion of this and refer it to the council for action before the end of December? That's the question I'm raising because I don't. I just assume not let it languish and frankly get it off our plate. Yeah, that was that was my idea. That I I knew this was a loose end, and I thought the finance committee might like to make a recommendation before the end of it. The this current council's term, um, finance is pretty busy, so I think it just depends on how um, if we can get some good feedback from the committee and then Dave and Sharon and I can look at that feedback and make changes to the policy before bringing it back to the committee so that they can make a recommendation. But that in terms of the committee agendas, that's an Andy question. Yeah, there's one biggie piece of property that may come up and that is that uh, if the Wildwood School is no longer being used as an elementary school and the school committee uh, determines that they no longer need it for educational purposes then it goes back to the town and uh, the surplus property question of what to do with that property uh, becomes a significant issue so just you know, alert you, alert us all to the possibility that you know, some council sometime may be looking at that issue. I'm looking at Paul to see 
um, how urgent he feels that is, but I don't imagine that it's it's an impending issue. Yeah, that's a couple years away. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think we have nothing further today to discuss on it because this was in the packet. So we have an opportunity to look at it and give it some thought and come back to it. So I think we've covered what we need to today unless somebody else has a hand raised. I assume we can go on and uh, to the next item. Andy, if I can ask if the committee has questions or comments or any feedback about the policy that they send it on to me and Dave so that we can work on a draft to bring back. Or do you want to save that for the next discussion? Uh, no, that's fine. If uh, anybody does have questions, uh, I, would, I would appreciate having a copy too, but we sent it to Athena and Dave so that uh, they can determine what's the best course of action. If we're going to move this through, uh, that would be helpful. Bob? It would be helpful to to see the current policy or the the one that this is to to replace. Just it would help me in reviewing it to see what we had in the past. Um, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't add that to the packet. I'll add it to the packet. Great. Thank you. And Andy, when do you want any? Or Athena and Andy, when when do you want any questions by? I again, I'm trying to keep moving this forward so that we finish it and get it to the council, um, I guess in December at the latest. We only have four meetings of the council between now and the end of the year. I think probably need to uh, pull up the, uh, see if I can find, Do you unless you have it, the meeting planning document, it would, it was in the, Um, I don't see it in the. I don't think it was in the packet. Hang no, on. it's not. It's um, and I'd want to make sure it comes from you, and or Athena, so that we make sure we have the latest one. All right, we do have an updated one. I'll add it to the packet. Yeah, you updated it since I, I didn't update, and then you were going to work on mine. So I assume you have the most most recent. Um, yours yours had the same comments that mine had. So what we're looking at is on the twenty seventh, fourth quarter and year end budget reports. Um, again, the disposition policy, rental registration fees, AHRA, and then if streetlight if streetlights is ready from TSO. Um, but I can I'll add this to the packet so that we see everyone can see what's coming up it's really after the 13th that things get really heavy after financial indicators the committee's going to start working on budget guidelines um things get and the um uh, surplus um, i'm sorry the uh supplemental appropriation requests that are coming on the 13th as well yeah i don't know if i can share if i can do the share screen now um, is that have it somewhere in my if this works. So, did it appear or not? It no. does not. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, I have it on my. Um, perhaps to move this along, Andy, I'll, I'll just ask for comments by next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. And uh, so Dave and I can discuss a new draft and um, get it before the committee again, whenever you're ready to take it up. I think I now have it. Oh, there we go. Um, so just so you know, and I was going to do this later, I'm not going to do it again. Uh, but to let you know that uh, we have been doing this kind of 
planning again as we did last spring to try and think our way through the remainder of the year and uh, see what today's uh, agenda that we, we've touched on every um, thing except for the rental registration piece, which we're going to close with. Next week, we have a meeting scheduled, and at that point, um, Holly's going to be able to present the fourth quarter and year-end budget reports, and uh, we are uh, coming back to the surplus real property disposition policy and the other two items that we talked about already, and then if TSO has a recommend, recommended policy on streetlights at that point, we would be able to add that and come back if we wished but we're really under the gun because as you see we're working along fairly quickly by the third we anticipate that if free cash is certified that there may be uh, some opportunity to talk about uh, the free cash uh, the free cash transfers really come out of uh, town manager recommendations. And uh, so that may not be available to us by the third, what uh, town manager's recommendations are. Uh, and, uh, but we're getting towards the point of thinking about the budget guidelines. So the question came up, if we had the opportunity in order to make the budget guideline discussion uh, a little bit uh, easier to manage for the committee, whether we wanted to have an initial discussion early on about uh, any of the issues having to do with budget guidelines that we might be able to uh, sort of uh, begin to, dis to discuss since we've had pretty much experience with developing guidelines. Uh, the financial indicators meeting is the 13th, and that's what usually kicks off the um, guidelines because that's when the initial projections come. And uh, that will also probably be posted as a finance committee meeting so that we can bring resident members into the meeting itself. So I would probably propose to add that to the finance committee in addition to the council and BCG. BCG means that uh, the school committee and library trustees are also a part of uh, that particular meeting. And then we're moving along into the end of the year work. And so we will add this to the uh, to the packet for today's meeting and uh, come back and allow for a discussion next week. But I did want to at least focus on what's anticipated for the 27th and the 3rd. Lynn, you have your hand up. Oh. And uh, this is really a question for Paul and Athena. But if, in fact, uh, we have free cash certified before the council meets again. Is that an automatic referral to finance? I don't what, believe so. But for what, to what purpose? I mean, for the there's no action. Yeah, it, it's only if you use that as a funding source that you need free cash certified. There's no action for the finance committee or the council to take once free cash is right. certified, unless and you can do something with it. Right, and usually when you once it's certified, you come to us with recommendations for how yes. you want appropriate. Okay, so yeah. there's no way that on the uh, that we can start discussing free cash on uh, November third. Well, there's no, there's nothing, there's nothing for the finance to discuss exactly regarding free cash. There will be an update from Holly about the fourth quarter budget and so on. But then the town manager is going to be submitting supplemental budget requests from free cash on the 13th. So, right, those will come, those will come to the finance committee then. Right, and we'll have those, we'll have those ahead of the 13th. Um, we'll need to post them by the 9th so the council can action act on the 20th. Right, so we'll have so them available. No 
but are those recommendations automatically referred to finance? I don't believe supplemental budget appropriations are automatically referred. I think it's the levying of taxes. I have to check the rules, but I don't believe so. Okay. The, uh, and it's just a matter of uh, what our current financial uh, management policies are uh, is that uh, once free cash is certified, free cash above 5% of the benchmark level uh, is then eligible for transfer. And um, the as it's written, the uh, between uh, the goal is to get the stabilization funds to 15%. And uh, if it goes, if the general stabilization fund is at 15% of the benchmark level, then the excess uh, we goes into the capital stabilization fund. And I think that's where our current policies are, though uh, a recommendation to do something different is certainly within the authority of the town manager. Let me also make another observation here, Andy, that I don't believe that we will be ready to make an AHRA recommendation until we know the status of free cash. Correct. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing so we can get back to the regular yeah. screen. Okay. Um, so are there any further questions or comments about that? Because that was going to be the last agenda item and it's now been pretty well disposed of. So I want to spend the rest of our time if needed and we don't have to stay till uh, the full two hours but i we want to get back to the rental registration uh, and uh i think paul was at the meeting last night crc was anybody else from the committee at the crc meeting so rob was there and hi rob uh, and Paul, either of you have any comments about the uh, CRC recommendations and the discussion that happened at the CRC meeting? Well, you, you saw the recommendations coming out of CRC. They um, tried to, they gave you a lot of information, but tried to simplify the um, fee structure because I think in response to some of the questions that were coming from the finance committee, um, with the bylaw coming out subject to sort of the actual fee schedule, I have sent that along to the town attorney for their review. One of the questions I think that was outstanding was about uh, resident preferential treatment, a discount for residents and how that could come into play. And just wanted to clarify that with the town attorney. Rob, was there anything? Uh just as a follow-up that the the CRC decided that, you know, the five-year uh, inspection schedule uh, makes the most sense for the program to be successful and uh, effective. And, you know, sticking with that, uh, you know, moved us into the conversation about a, a simplified fee schedule that uh, it, is reasonable and would accomplish uh, collecting the, the necessary fees to support the program. And and just one other thing is to clarify and to confirm that we did with, with the strategic partnership agreement with the university, we do have a hundred thousand dollars that's available to support this program because that's was sort of the intent of some of some of that funds to support um, neighborhood issues, and this would be an appropriate use of some of those funds. Andy, would you like me to put the fee schedule up? Uh, in a minute, um, Paul, when you said some of the funds from the university, have, um, are there other competing or uses, other uses we should be considering when making that calculation? Not necessarily, because what I'm what I'm saying is that you could use the full hundred thousand, but I don't think when we did the projections, we were going to require that entire amount. Uh, 
you know, the more you put in, then the less fees possibly could calculate. potentially, but yeah. But also, you, um, I think we're there could be other opportunities if there are other over the next five years, if there are other needs that pop up, it's nice to have some money available to use if there's things that we would like to see happen in neighborhoods. I think um, I'm going to ask one more question and, and certainly looking for raised hands at any time because this isn't uh, this is a committee discussion. So please do raise your hands. But one of the things that I had been concerned about for a while, and Rob, you might have some comments on this. Uh, what degree of flexibility should the staff have about scheduling in order to accommodate for situations such as um, turnover in staff, illness of staff, um, other demands on staff time that might interfere with being able to complete the schedule is uh, is a rigid schedule uh, uh, really within uh, the best interests of an efficiently managed program. So, yeah, it is a, um, you know, a very structured schedule of inspections over the, the the five year period uh the the plan is to uh visit 600 dwelling units in any year to accomplish that uh the flexibility exists where the we have the ability to select the exact number of units we inspect in the larger complexes so the, that's not totally defined yet uh, and we don't have the count on how many units are uh, currently in uh, you know a, a housing inspection program by some other agency that we would be taking into account as well. So I think when I you know when I put together the estimate for staff needed to accomplish that many that many inspections, it does it does uh, account for you know uh, unknowns. You know, we, we don't know how many follow-up inspections will necessarily be needed, uh, how many court visits will be needed. So it isn't a, you know, eight to four uh, scheduled daily of inspections. Uh, it, it's far fewer than that to account for this additional, these additional unknowns. Uh, so I was comfortable with the number of staff we were suggesting. Now, say it's completely wrong, you know, we find something out that, you know, that I, I wasn't anticipating. Uh, the rules and regulations can be modified uh, by the Board of License Commissioners to either change the uh, duration of the inspection or, um, you know, give f farther flexibility, further flexibility in, uh, you know, how often we visit the properties or the number of properties that we, have, we visit in any particular year. Uh, but I don't anticipate that being the case, and I and I certainly wouldn't anticipate you know having to go to Paul just to have him tell me no, you can't have more inspectors. So you know I I think this was was carefully considered uh, to be a program that we could be um, you know we we could accomplish this and and make sure the program is successful. Thank you, because I think you just in that last comment. Addressed as my concern is uh, whether a by, uh, the bylaw and regulations as proposed would create a rigidity that would force a budget recommendation uh, in and of itself just to accommodate the program. Are there other? Can I? Can I? Sorry. Can I just add yeah. I, I, one other thing? You know, and. When we start this program and we we understand how things, um, you know, exist out there, you know, the discussions should be open and continuing because uh, there might be an opportunity to to not have to reinspect properties or you know really start to identify those properties that are very well cared for. Uh, so there's there's just so many options on where this could go in the future. So I think these discussions would have to be open and I, you know, would expect to be able to report on what, what is found once we uh, do get into inspecting the properties. Thanks. 
Matt. Thank, thanks, Andy, and thank you, Rob. Um, I have one one programmatic question, and then I know we're going to get into the fee structure a little bit, so I'll I'll hold off. But um, Rob, just to be clear, so my understanding is that if your if if staff have concerns about a building or or a complex a complex that they this is what I was told by John they they can file their own complaint and conduct an investigation into that apartment complex or into that rental is that is that accurate that is accurate yes okay i think that was that misconception is out there and i just wanted to clarify it Lynn? thanks um i I, I'm going to actually refer to this and also back to the, the thing we just looked at. Of all of the things that are pending out there that may come to the council um, before this term is up, I would like to place a high priority on this because it's the kind of thing that I don't want to see a new configuration of CRC and a new configuration of the Finance Committee wrestle with again. And I think it's something I I certainly know from the many conversations I've had with residents. Uh, this is highly desired in Amherst. It is the only, um, it, it, what we keep hearing is have a bylaw and make sure you can make, you can enforce it. And in a district like the one I represent, where we've got a number of student rentals, where the worst problems are mostly in housing, student, house student rentals, not in complexes. I'm not saying that's all true. I just wanna make sure that we move this to the priority level, understanding that it has to go to CRC, it has to go to GOL yet, and it has to come to the council and uh, is it a zoning? Even if it isn't a zoning, it should have two readings at the council level. Um, so I'm putting pressure on keeping it moving fast. Um, I do want to ask, to the extent possible, how much of this has had legal review? I think there have been conversations with the town attorney early on, but this since we've got an actual vote from CRC, uh, this morning I sent that happened last night. So I sent the actual version to town attorney for their review. Okay. Great. Thank you. There's one issue, and I think I mean Rob can add to this, but um, if we don't complete the work before the end of this council, then I think it becomes more difficult to implement the regulation with the next year um, as the rental registration year is defined. Right. And uh, so that uh, if we can't move it through during this council, then we lose um, a whole year of being able to implement it. Exactly. Uh, I see Rob nodding his head yes, so that there's no further need for discussion on that point and uh anna rob I, I i apologize for my ignorance on this i know that we have currently a job posting for a uh an inspector and that is that is a different role than a code enforcement officer is that right so um the reason why i was looking at it i was thinking about the the um the time that it, we are in where it's really hard to find staffing and just making sure that you feel that as a competitive salary and that will get applicants. And obviously you wouldn't have put it out there if you didn't think it was a competitive salary and we'd get applicants. But um, I just wanted to confirm that that is different than the um, the posting that's currently out there. It, it is. Uh, currently the posting is for a health inspector, uh, a, a prior health inspector, Ed Smith, uh, ended up taking the position that John left vacant as lead code enforcement officer and will, uh, you know, be at the lead of this program. Uh, so currently we're trying to fill uh, the health inspector vacancy. And in the future, the 
the position that would be needed uh, for uh, this program is uh, more of a housing uh, health or building inspector. There's flexibility on the, the exact background for the individual uh, and it could go a couple of different ways. So I'm hoping that there, it, it's, um, it's not gonna be defined so specifically to a type of inspector that I think we would ha hopefully be able to uh, generate some interest uh, within our current uh, set of schedule uh, job descriptions that we have. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think I was asking just mostly because when I was looking at that other, cause I was trying to solve my own problem, but um, when I was looking at it, there, there was a lot of code enforcement in that, in that job description and the salary, I wasn't sure if that was, um, I mean, 55 to 74 K a year for that lead inspector role. And so I was trying to do math on again, ensuring that we're able to pull people into this. Cause I think what we don't want to have happen and nobody wants this, including you is to start this program up and not be able to find anyone to fill the role. Right. And I, and I do believe it's slightly adjusted from that figure uh, because the uh, union uh, negotiations were, were completed. So I think that, that, that uh, salary range is a little bit higher than what was uh, posted in that earlier. Thank you. Document. Thanks. So I'm looking to see if there are other comments to make. I just, just to say, Lynn, you had talked about uh, hearing a lot from the community about support for the, doing the rental registration program modifications. I think that what's concerned me when I have heard those comments is that uh, there seems to also be a lot of belief that it's going to solve problems of enforcement of the number of um, unrelated residents in a property or um, some of the noise and other uh, problems that exist with student rental housing from the perception of the people who are making these comments. And uh, neither of those is really something that is an inspection issue. Uh, so I, I I just do know want to note that for the discussion, but nothing else because it's not really a topic that affects the question of the fee structure, which is what we're all about. So are there any questions? The last thing I'll pose to the committee is there any questions about the uh, calculations that were made by CRC that somebody can help us with or that we want to uh, send back to CRC for further, Anna? Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out just some clarity on the um, inspection fee in the, and, and I, this might totally be me missing it, but in the, um, in the, proposed schedule, it says inspection fee 150. And then in the sample, it says 150 plus $50 per unit above one. And I just wanted to confirm, is it a flat fee or is it um, variable based on the number of units as the pars as the um, permitting is? Leave it to first see if somebody can... for me, I'm not sure. Yep. So in that document, um, I wasn't sure if there was going to be an additional fee above it just because it was highlighted like that. So I, I just wanted clarity that there was not going to be, that it's a flat fee. So, uh, can I answer that, Andy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my my recommendation uh, that we discussed yesterday for the part of the meeting that I was there and I did miss the, the end of the discussion uh, is it is definitely a flat fee, so not a additional per unit fee. And um, where I where I see confusion here is that in my discussion, it was one hundred fifty dollars per unit, so per inspect per unit that's inspected, not per parcel, as that okay. uh, reads in the box. That makes uh, sense. Unless you know, unless Paul thinks that something else happened after I left, that's that was my understanding. Okay. Thank you.
And of course, we had a public comment uh, during the public comment portion of the meeting, and I made a request that uh, person who offered public comment uh, send her recommendation in writing, and uh, I will share that with the committee when when received. So, is there anything else people want to raise today in the way of questions about CRC or uh, Matt? So, <clears throat> just, I mean, this is, I guess, is my, just my scratch notes on the broad um, overall cost of the program. And I just want to make sure, Rob and others, that I've, I've got it accurate. Um, so, essentially, the, the new program um, would require us, these are all estimates, but out of the um, out of CRC's memo, new program would cost us about 474,000. Um, 100,000 100, of that we're projecting to come from UMass and the other 374 would come from fee revenue. And that would be a break even on the program. And the current scheme is um, we have revenue about 293,000, 293,500, uh, and administrative costs of about 150,000. So the current scheme nets us about 143 in revenue to the general fund. So that's that's just my scratch notes looking at, at the CRC um, memo. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate based on the, the fee schedule adjustment that occurred last year. Uh, and there was no there was no change in the, the program costs at that time because this this uh, was still being developed. Okay. Okay, well, and I'll just since I've got the floor, I'll just congratulate you on getting um, somebody into that lead to that lead role because I know it's been a long time coming. I guess the other thing that I've thought about uh, so we build this structure as we're talking about the number of rental properties remains relatively the same. Do we need some projections for years out in order to feel comfortable with what we're with what we're recommending? Because the number of inspections may change, um, but uh, we also know that salaries will in, and other costs will increase. And um, so it's not, you know, these numbers are not static. They're kind of first year numbers. Should we be thinking out farther as we're analyzing this? I don't know, uh, Paul, if you have anyone. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we, Sean in the prior day. Of course, I guess I say that daily. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can certainly do that. I think that it's modeled on an annual basis, but um, some some of the costs on impact on property owners, if you see, is a pro, it's modeled on a five year plan because that's how it's being implemented. So if you see on on the screen, the third column over says proposed total application fees over five years, uh, there there is a project a five year projection included in this. Were there adjustments made to the cost side? Since this is the revenue side. I don't think there were. I think that's sort of, you know, there'd be the 2% or 3%, whatever we wind up with that would go every year. Yeah. So. And that's why I like having a little bit of flex in the, um, not allocating all of the money from the strate strategic partnership agreement that allows us to manage some of that. Yeah, because if I, my calculation is correct, the first year, would be the 67,540 plus the 22,519, which is $90,059. And if that is right, if my analysis, if, if that thinking is right, then 
there's about ten thousand dollars that is actually unexpended from that amount mm -hmm. in the first year. Okay. I don't think we have anything else at this point. I think that the committee needs some time to digest this and then come back and uh, think about the uh, what our next steps are. And I will forward uh, Ms. Shepard's recommendation to us, uh, which we can then uh, take your numbers and see what that does when you start plugging it in. Uh, I don't really have much else that I feel comfortable saying until I have more, more of a sense of uh, that and I had time to study it myself a little bit more. So does anyone have anything else that they would like to raise on the subject of the rental registration at this point? Paul? Yeah, so if there are people who have comments or suggestions or specific questions, we'd really appreciate getting them in advance so um, we can look at them, have time to look at them. So, I mean, I, are you driving towards a vote on next Friday, Andy? I don't necessarily assume that we are, but uh, we've allowed ourselves, I think, three meeting flexibility on this. Okay. Um, but I think your point still remains the same that if anybody has any ideas, don't wait until next Friday. Uh, go ahead and send them in earlier. And that would be helpful. Uh, I guess uh, as long as they uh, get to Paul and Athena and me, I think that, that would be the best way to do it if you just send it send additional comments or questions to the three of us and then it'll allow Paul and uh, Athena to sort out the questions to the appropriate person who can help them the best. So with that said, and getting back to our agenda, uh, we've talked about schedule of next meetings and work plan, which was item number six which then brings us to topics that were not anticipated when we uh, put together the agenda. Uh, wondering if anybody from the committee, I have no additional topics. Uh, if nobody from the committee has any additional topics, I think that uh, we have uh, managed to beat our two hour goal. So, uh, thank you, and uh, we'll follow through with next week's meeting. Great. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Bye, everybody. Bye.